last but not least, we're going to talk about sentences. This is as high as we get in terms of overall temporal scale in this language section. So we're going to think about how we can integrate information over time and come up with some kind of representation in the brain that captures the overall structure and semantics of a sentence. And the, the classic kind of example of a syntactic diagram looks like this. Uh, you have these kind of noun phrase, verb phrase, tree structures, you decompose a higher level structure into subcomponents. Uh, so a noun phrase is then composed of an art, art, article and a noun, et cetera, et cetera. So these you know, provide nice descriptions of uh, the syntax, but uh, when we look at real world language, you end up with a lot of very interesting cases like this. Time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. And so these are really very isomorphic sentences, but in fact, they have very different uh, syntactic trees, right? So like here is kind of uh, a adverb modifying flying. Um, and here, like is a verb, and fruit flies are the kind of subject. And so you have a really different uh, parse of each of these things. And these are, you know, maybe sort of example sentences, maybe not most representative of everything, but you do have a lot of cases. Here's another fun one. The slippers were found by the nosy dog, and the slippers were found by the sleeping dog. Just this one word changes whether the uh, agent of the sentence um, is kind of the dog who's finding the slippers um, or whether it's kind of, you know, the dog is just an, um, an article, a kind of uh, modifier that tells you where the slippers were found. And so we can see from these examples that in general, uh, syntax depends on semantics also, as we mentioned earlier, and you've seen plenty of examples of during these lectures and every other example of spoken um, language that, in fact, you know, we don't always follow syntactic rules very carefully or even very frequently follow formal syntactic rules very closely. Uh, George W. Bush uh, was a classic example of somebody who often spoke completely wrong and yet people kind of vaguely understood what he was saying. And so these are, uh, you know, our ability to understand language fundamentally depends on getting the right semantic interpretation. We're, our goal in language is communication, it's understanding, and syntax is kind of an, at that level um, only important insofar as it advances that underlying goal of comprehension. And, and so, you know, there's, there's, you have to kind of put these things in perspective. Uh, linguists kind of get uh, really into these kind of you know, describing all these different uh, funny terms for all these different things in these trees, but really it's, it's fundamentally about communication. So how do we integrate uh, these different aspects? I mean, you do need to have some kind of syntactic information to really uh, get a full understanding of what's being said. Um, how do we integrate syntax with semantics? And so uh, here's our G.W. Bush quote here, family is where our nation finds hope, where wings take dream. Uh, so just a bunch of word salad, but you kind of get the idea, okay? Um, and so this kind of idea that you just kind of get the idea is this notion of this gestalt. And this is the model we're gonna look at. It's called the sentence gestalt model. Uh, this notion that we have an overall interpretation of what's being said, uh, some kind of distributed pattern of activity like we talked about with the wordles where you have some kind of, you know, complete pattern of activity in your brain that represents a, a thought, a concept, um, no matter how structured or unstructured that might be. Um, and, and you want to communicate that. Uh, we want to get that back into somebody else's head. And so what does it take to activate that kind of gestalt? What kind of, um, uh, uh, how do we know if there is, what kind of knowledge is present in that gestalt? These are important questions. So this is the classic sentence gestalt model. Uh, St. John and McClellan developed this model originally um, in the 80s or 90, I think in the 90s. Here's what the model looks like. This is actually slightly different even than the original version that we had in our textbook because we're now using a predictive learning 
model. So this is our Deep Libra predictive learning model based on the thalamocortical circuitry. And it has this idea that we make predictions every 100 milliseconds on the pulvinar uh, nucleus of the thalamus and that the deep layers in particular are important for generating those predictions and the predictions get rendered. And so this P layer here is a kind of pulvinar layer showing the prediction, conveniently P prediction pulvinar. Um, and that's generated by the encoder layer, which receives these inputs. The inputs are individual words. We can kind of look at a particular sentence as we start going through here. And so we get one word at a time, which is, you know, pretty interesting. So we really have to integrate across each individual trial here to get an overall sense of what the meaning is. And this is another really important aspect of the sentence model, as opposed to the earlier models we've looked at. Now we're really dealing with kind of uh, this temporally evolving nature of language. And so we're, we're getting each individual word, the schoolgirl. We got the verb, which was um, spread. And the encoder layer, by the way, is then trying to kind of predict what word is going to come up next. Um, we're also querying the internal representations that develop up here in the gestalt main layer and its corresponding deep layer in terms of these role filler question. So we're asking here, uh, what did the um, agent do? And the, the verb here is spread. And then previously it was asking who is the agent of the sentence? And that was schoolgirl. And then uh, now we can see jelly. So the schoolgirl is spreading jelly, presumably on crackers or something like that. Um, and so these are a very simple, small micro world corpus that was created by St. John to you know, uh, give certain semantic uh, information to the network um, so that it could actually learn about you know, what schoolgirls tend to do, what uh, the teachers tend to do, etc. A big part of what we look at in this model is how the model kind of learns about that semantic information, but also how it learns about the uh, syntactic information, um, how it knows kind of what these roles are, and a big part of that in English is the word order. If you say the schoolgirl at the start of the sentence, generally speaking, that's, that means that that's going to be the agent of the sentence. If, unless you hear the word was, and so we do have those kind of passive versions. So the schoolgirl was driven to the school by the bus driver, for example. The schoolgirl is now the kind of patient, not the agent in the sentence. It also has modifiers. And you can learn about adjectives and adverbs and stuff. So uh, overall, you get a pretty, you know, reasonable small sample of English syntax and semantics here in this world. So uh, the model is learning as a result of predicting what the next word will be and through these kind of more explicit role filler queries. And we think these role filler queries would correspond to you know, actually acting in the world uh, on the knowledge that you're receiving, answering questions, uh, um, directing further conversation about these events. All these things would be cases in which you'd need to sort of know what was the semantic content that you got from the sentence and then apply that. But here it's just very simple and explicit where we're just asking who was, who did what and what. Um, the deep layers, as I mentioned, are uh, representing a um, cortical deep layer pathway that generates predictions back down here on the input. And so the predictions of what word is going to come next are generated by the encoding layer. The other thing that the deep layers do is maintain contextual information, very much like a simple recurrent network. Uh, this was a technique that was developed in the 80s by Jeff Ellman and also Michael Jordan. And it was what was used in the original St. John and McClellan sentence gestalt model. Uh, and we actually think that the deep layers of the cortex play a role very much like these kind of context layers. Um, they take information from the superficial layers, their corresponding superficial layers, and uh, encode that and maintain that over time in order to generate predictions about what's going to happen next. And similarly, the Gestalt deep layer is encoding a context from the prior Gestalt times step and using that to help uh, interpret and contextualize the new input that's coming in. And so information kind of flows up through the encoding into the Gestalt and then the decode layer kind of reads out 
information from the Gestalt layer in order to answer these questions. So, so we can use uh, cluster plots to understand what's going on in the hidden layer and see the kinds of uh, similarity structures that are developing. So the first thing we can see in the Gestalt layer is that the representations end up being very verb-centered um, and this has been borne out with subsequent research showing that a lot of our syntactic and semantic knowledge is really tied up and, and organized around verbs. And so Martha Palmer and her colleagues, for example, have a whole system based on something called VerbNet um, and, you know, all the kind of argument structure and dative and transitive and all these other kinds of things that people, linguists talk about in terms of uh, what, what kind of different verbs there are really uh, play a critical role in shaping what kind of syntactic structures each one can support. And we see that even in this very simple model that the kind of first level of structure, the most uh, broad scale of structure is about the verb. So drive here, stir here, ate here. Those verb level uh, representations then get modified in the finer grain in terms of the different agents and then um, uh, furthermore, within that, you could look at differences in terms of the patients. So you got a kind of verb first, then agent, then other kind of modifiers. And so that makes sense in terms of what we think should be happening. And the model, again, just through pure learning processes, learns to develop that kind of structure. These general principles have held up well and have been expanded into the current kind of uh, computational linguistics, deep neural network approaches. However, we still, in these models, don't have any kind of explicit, you know, uh, sort of metacognitively accessible knowledge, and I do think that is something that's really missing. Um, so even though these do capture a lot of important properties, kind of first order properties about how language is processed, um, probably having some kind of more metacognitively accessible explicit knowledge about, um, you know, what is a verb and what is a noun, etc. Would probably be more characteristic of what people have and enable the system to be more flexible and more systematic in its generalization.